an absolute pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Pablo Zarco Tejeda, who, uh, who I met actually July last year, July last year at a conference, and I said we have to get him across here to give an amazing uh, talk about how we actually combine some of this technology that many of us are quite aware of, but perhaps don't really have a good understanding of how to use, <laughs> how the latest trends are in the industry. I listened to Pablo's talk in Queensland, I was quite fascinated by his breadth of knowledge in the technology sector as well as the applications of that technology. And I think many of you will find his talk quite fascinating. I'm not going to give too much introduction to him, but I will say a few things. He's uh, jointly appointed between the School of Agriculture and the Melbourne School of Engineering. So that gives him, I guess, expertise across both sectors. And I think that's something that makes this talk quite unique. Uh, he's also honorary scientist at the National Research Council of Spain, leader of the Hyperspec a hypersense lab. He's the primary focus in remote sensing, precision agriculture, forestry, natural vegetation, biotic and abiotic stress detection using hyperspectral and thermal images acquired by various manned and unmanned aircraft. He got his engineering degree from Spain, masters in the UK and a PhD in Canada. So he's been all around the world, which again provides a geographic diversity in his experiences. And on top of that, He's been a faculty member at the University of California, Davis, and the director of the Institute of Sustainable Agriculture, and the leader of the Laboratory for Research Methods in Quantitative Remote Sensing since 2012. He has been a senior scientist at the Joint Research Center and the European Commission leading the development of remote sensing algorithms for biosecurity using thermal and hyperspectral remote sensing imagery. He has been the principal investigator of projects with the European Union European Space Agency and industry funded contracts focused on precision agriculture and forestry. So, ladies and gentlemen, please give uh, our professor here a wonderful welcome to La Trobe University and to our goodbye. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here in La Trobe University. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to come. Um, it's been a bit more than a year that I arrived here in Australia um, to um, join the University of Melbourne. Um, my, my background, um, in fact, uh, um, as you were saying, I'm in a joint appointment with, between the School of Agriculture and the School of Engineering. My, my in first um, degree was in Ag Engineering, so I'm, I'm an engineer with focus in agriculture, but I've been trained um, uh, after that in physics, mostly in physics and physiology, trying to apply remote sensing methods, um, physically based approaches into understanding the physiology. And um, if I have to um, have to say which are the keywords or the fields in which I, I, I feel um, I'm contributing the most, I would say that um, um, remote sensing for vege vegetation and stress detection would be um, a very good summary of what I actually do. Um, precision agriculture, precision forestry, plant physiology, stress detection in the context of biotic and abiotic stress, um, also applying to um, harmful diseases that uh, are affecting uh, worldwide. Um, and then looking at the technology, both from manned or unmanned uh, vehicles, um, because of the different requirements that we need to collect data in the best possible way. Um, so I established uh, this hypersense hyper lab when I arrived just a year ago, or a year and a half ago, here in to Australia. And the main focus is on using platforms um, like a manned aircraft. Uh, I established the airborne facility at the university because we didn't have a plane, and that's what I've been doing in the last 20 years. I've been flying planes. I'm not a pilot, but uh, I install cameras in planes and we collect data because we cannot do it uh, from current satellites and from current uh, platforms um, in orbit. Obviously, as well with um, uh, unmanned vehicles and in the context of natural vegetation, obtaining high-resolution images in the hyperspectral domain. I will talk about 
what is the image against spectroscopy and the hyperspectral domain that I focus my work and with applications on different aspects that uh, I'm, I'm sure are of interest to you or some of you, which is plant phenotyping, plant breeding, um, irrigation, water stress detection, nutrient assessment. Um, using the latest uh, technology available, I will also discuss a bit about my feeling regarding technology and methods. Um, but all my work, in fact, uh, really starts at the, at the leaf level. Um, we are trying to understand the physiology, we are trying to understand the way photosynthetic pigments um, absorb light, the way they get degraded, or the, the way they change as a function of stress. So all these processes need to be understood at the leaf level first. If we want to later on try to detect those changes at the canopy level or at the image level. Um, at the end, we try to understand at the leaf level all the processes, but uh, this is the type of approach that we make, that we try to, to do in order to collect data of high resolution in the different spectral domains, which requires a very important effort at the laboratory level. It's not just buying a camera, putting in a platform, whatever type of platform it is, and then fly, because um, images need to be well calibrated because we are looking at the physics and if we don't get good radiometrically calibrated um, data sets all we are doing is assessing correlations which are okay in some cases but uh, are probably not the best uh, for our understanding of the physiological changes that we need to so anyway i established this um, urban facility i wanted to introduce it before i go into the actual methods and and te technology um, with different instruments. Um, we have um, hyperspectral um, cameras, thermal, two hyperspectral cameras and one thermal camera um, working in the thermal infrared region, in very narrow band hyperspectral fluorescence, and um, um, also looking at the veneer in the spectral region in the 400 to 1000 nanometers. Before I go ahead and I keep talking about the actual physiology and the actual requirements that we had to do in the last 20 years, I'd like to um, describe for any of you who is not familiar with hyperspectral remote sensing or with imaging spectroscopy, the meaning of that. Um, and it's quite simple to understand. Um, if we take an image of uh, just one band, imagine any grayscale picture that you can remember, that would be monochrome, and that would be just one layer. If we take a picture with our cell phone, which is something that we all understand, we will be collecting data in three bands, or the three basic colors, blue, green, and red. That would be an RGB image. So we are collecting data from you, from the floor, from plants, at three specific bands, the blue, the green, and the red. If instead of three, we use a device that uh, allows to collect, collect data in not three, but five, six, 10, 12, 20, whatever number, then we are moving into something that is called multispectral. And uh, with new sensors and technology that is become available, we can decide at which specific spectral bands we can or we want to collect the data. We may think uh, we can start dreaming or thinking about, okay, well, if I'm looking into one specific pigment, then let's define the spectral bands for the detection or the quantification of, the, of that specific um, pigment. Okay, that's possible. If instead of um, 5, 10, 20 spectral bands in specific regions of the collective, 100 or 1000 or and they will be all contiguous and connected one to the other then we are now talking about something that we call hyperspectral there is a controversy in some way and the debate about if the name is correct or not what it was multispectral um, or what is hyperspectral it was multispectral several years ago what is the actual meaning of hyper there but anyway we are talking about i think that the most common name would be imaging spectroscopy and the whole idea is that uh, if we 
collect an image of those leaves. Could be near field, could be in the laboratory, in the greenhouse, or could be it's installed on a plane. If we click on any pixel of that image, we the third dimension will be the spectrum. So that means that we have we show here for that particular pixel we show the spectral signature. Our work in some way is to analyze this spectrum in a way that we apply physics, uh, we apply our understanding of the modeling methods that we have available in order to say, okay, I haven't destroyed the leaf, I just made a picture, I took an image on several spectral bands and by correctly analyzing the spectrum, I can already tell if that leaf has such amount of chlorophyll, coronoids, and cyanines, xanthophylls, I mean anything that is absorbing light. And I will get into that uh, later on. If instead of um, using that hyperspectral camera to take that particular image, we would collect the same but with multispectral, then we would be relying on a number of spectral bands. And that is not bad at all. It's just that we wouldn't have all the information that is needed in some cases where we need more spectral uh, data. The whole idea then is that, I mean, in, I'm sure you are all aware, uh, aware of, of this because you, you use it, many of you in, in the laboratory, for example, with spectrophotometers and any other instrument like that. The idea is, okay, well, let's mount it on a platform. Could be a plane, could be an unmanned vehicle, could be tractor, mobile platform. And while the uh, plane is moving along, we are forming an image and that image is that the scanning of the surface and for every single pixel we are going to have the full signature the full hyperspectral um, image so that is the concept and that is what i've been doing the last 20 or more years um, that's the plane we have currently here available in in melbourne it's for research purposes more than happy to collaborate with any of you interested on using this type of research platform for any research uh, idea. I'm using it to supervise PhD students in aspects uh, related to um, both engineering and agriculture or physiology-based uh, assessments, uh, developing algorithms uh, for the detection of stress. As an example, some people ask me, well, why don't you use drones? Well, I've been using drones in many years. I started uh, and I'll show you some of the results that we got also from drones. Um, I'm, and I'll, at the end, I will also discuss a bit about my, my feeling about the, how the science goes in remote sensing in terms of the application with, uh, with drones. When we are dealing with uh, specific experiments, small scale, plant phenotyping, plant breeding experiments, I think that the drones are a perfect platform. If we need to fly thousands of hectares, I think the drones are not the best. And that's an example of more than 6,000 hectares that we flew just a few months ago over wheat in here in Victoria. In one single flight, that's uh, hyperspectral and thermal data that uh, allowed us to get thermal imaging at the resolution that is not possible from any current satellite available. And that shows the spatial within field spatial variability of the canopy temperature, which is associated, or we can link it with the uh, stress levels and different things that uh, we are um, uh, that we are studying. Um, no, that's an example of the hyperspectral for one particular uh, mosaic. These are things that we can now do much faster than before. I'll talk about as well in what the developments of the technology and the methods um, it's been in the last 20 years. So anyway, if, if we if we want to, or if I want to talk about what happens in the last 20 years in terms of imaging, spectroscopy, hyperspectral, and physiology, I, I like to go back to some of the early work done in the, the so-called bioindicators project. Um, that's me with no so much uh, gray hair uh, 20 years ago in Canada. And uh, we were developing the first, um, some of the very first projects on bioindicators to identify and to develop physiological indicators of veget vegetation condition that we used to call it. Um, 
we've been talking about bioindicators and we've been talking about indicators of stress and physiology-based traits. Now we call them plant traits or spectral plant traits. And if, in fact, if, if we go even farther back, if we go to the 80s, paper by Ricci, he already talks about specific bioindicators that uh, needed special attention because they were the way of understanding the physiology. And he already, they already talked about chlorophyll pigments and chlorophyll concentration as a link to photosynthesis, Lifferia index as an structural indicator, very well known, but already talking about the spectral reflectance and particularly chlorophyll fluorescence for the link to photosynthetic capacity and photosynthetic efficiency. And the main conclusions in that uh, last uh, few years before getting into the year 2000 were that uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not talking particularly about what I did, I'm talking about the whole scientific community. Mapping chlorophyll concentration in closed canopies was feasible using hyperspectral imagery. I think that was already demonstrated. But in heterogeneous canopies, non-uniform, and we can imagine many of them in horticulture, for example, or in some specific forestry areas, that was not possible. The quantification of leaf biochemicals in heterogeneous canopies needed further developments, and we had to do something about it. We had to develop models and methods to be able to quantify the biochemistry in those non-uniform um, canopies. Chlorophyll fluorescence. Nowadays, if we go to any conference or any meeting with uh, people, uh, scientists working fluorescence, we now all agree that we can do it. At that time, we could see things in the spectrum. We didn't know if that was actual chlorophyll fluorescence emission. So that was a very important physiological indicator, but, but was not possible at that time to map it and to quantify using reliable methods and technology. Um, and the quantification of other physiological and photosynthetic um, pigments like coronoids or xanthophylls was too complex. It was too complex because we didn't have the tools, we didn't have the modeling, we didn't have the rapid transfer in place to be able to separate it between them, looking at the absorption of the different constituents. And something I had to face from the operational point of view, it was really expensive and difficult and a very large effort. What does it mean? Well, nowadays in many groups and my students, they expect that we fly today, we have the data tomorrow. Well, I had to wait months to get the data processed. Or um, I had to wait weeks or months to collect data whenever I need it, because we had to rely on other institutions, normally national institutions or internationals, uh, international institutions which would come to our study sites. So in terms of relying on others and on, in terms of processing the data, it was a very difficult uh, effort. So there's, there are a number of limitations. I'm talking now in the year 2000, so number of limitations and progress that was needed in the context, context of canopy health monitoring. And I'd like to discuss about each of them and the progress that was made on each of them in order to reach the um, status in which uh, we are right now. Um, we needed methods to understand the scaling up from leaf to the canopy. Um, we had to develop methods to understand the rhyopsis transfer and the optical properties of the leaf um, spectral and the leaf um, structure and architecture um, when measuring reflectance and transmittance using interrating spheres or any other instrument that was available um, at that time linked or connected to spectrometers. Um, Later on, with several handheld spectral devices uh, that um, are available from PSI, from other companies, the traditional SPAD meter from Minolta, that was the very first one to try to measure changes in chlorophyll that will associate to nitrogen. 
but uh, the missing part was not so much on the technical aspect. The missing part was the development of the royalty structure, I mean the physics behind the understanding of the absorption through different layers of the leaves and the pigments that were are absorbing light uh, in the leaves. Um, that was a very big progress in the last 20 years in the development of drugs transfer models, physically based, not empirical. I mean, we want to develop models that are useful and valid for any type of species that is not developed for one particular species, and now we go to another one and then it fails. And from simple play models to ray tracing Monte Carlo approaches of 3D modeling, we have now a very wide range of simulation uh, approaches that allow us to quantify pigments. I'll go back to that later on. But the most important thing was not only to work at the leaf level and to understand the physics of the light interactions between vegetation, I mean leaves and the light, it was actually to understand the scaling up from the leaf level to the canopy level. Uh, as a scientist, normally we start at the leaf level in the laboratory under control conditions. And that's very good because that we have control of everything that is happening there. Uh, what happens when we fly is that uh, we have other aspects. We have a media that is no longer a leaf. We don't have leaves here. We have an image. We have the canopy. And the physics of the light interaction between um, photons and the tissues is totally different at the leaf level than at the canopy level. So we need to understand the physics of the leaf level to the canopy level. And particularly if we want to use simulations or modeling methods which are valid for canopies which have very different structures or architectures. And that's very simple to see there visually the differences. The fact is that the physics of the way the light interacts depends on how much soil and what is the actual um, dimensions and architecture of the actual canopies. That's in agriculture. Imagine if we mix it uh, into, if we put a uh, forest, forestry in, in it, uh, where we have um, very, very different uh, architectures uh, as well. And some cases we have broad leaves, other ones we have needles. I mean, all these combinations make it really difficult that the models which are not physically based, the ones that are empirically developed would work across different countries. So from simple to more complex approaches, from considering that the canopy is a turbid medium uniform canopy where we assume that they are all particles, let's imagine that would be valid for the canopy, um, to something much more complex. And they said has been a development of physically based methods that allow us to understand what happens to the yeah, energy, to the radiation that is getting early. Way, depending on the and geometry and depending on the architecture of the canopies. And that is critical if we want to make good assessments of plant trade in our experiments when we are across different species, or even when we have plants that in studies, for example, we have the same species with different varieties that have different uh, characteristics. Um, approaches needing to be developed to link this leaf to the canopy, uh, models and um, by this approach of linking leaf models with canopy models, from images and from the spectra that we retrieved, um, we can now quantify plant traits, biochemical constituents. Basically, anything that absorbs light can be estimated. Secondly, and obviously anything that is embedded already in the models that we have developed and that we can use in our um, studies. I will go back again to this leap to canopy because that's being very critical. Secondly, there was a need 20 years ago for the development of new indicators of early stress. Why is that? Well, because we had a number of indicators which are very good for assessing the 
and monitoring the structure of the canopies. I'm talking about, for, for any of you who is a bit familiar with remote sensing and DVI, the normalized different vegetation index, and that is okay. It's a very good index to monitor the growth. But small changes in physiology are not captured by the structure. Small changes in physiology, I mean small changes in photosynthesis or in stomatal conductance, for example. So we needed to develop vegetation stress indicators um, for the early, to understand the dynamics and to understand and to detect it as early as possible. So reductions in transpiration rates and CO2 uh, absorption reductions or photosynthesis reductions are typical under stress conditions and there's a number of indicators that needed development and needed more attention. For example, canopy temperature because of the reduction in the um, evaporative cooling that happens to plants which are not transpiring, transpiring at full and those changes in that reduction in the evapor evapor evaporative cooling because of the reduction of the stomatal conductance would actually make an increase in the in the canopy temperature. If there is no evaporative cooling, then there is no reduction of um, canopy temperature that is happening to a plant transpiring uh, at food. So that's something that we have been developing and testing on different crops and different conditions that is instrumenting trees with uh, sensors, temp uh, temperature, thermal sensors like the one you see there, or for example, in, in vineyards. I mean, originally uh, this was done in wheat and, and maize as well. And the whole idea is that uh, um, stressed uh, vegetation due to the lack of water would be detected by using canopy temperature and thermal sensing. And with the development of indicators like the crop water stress index, which is a normalized index between the minimum and the maximum that the plant would be transpiring, we would develop relationships between the C uh, CWSI and showing the relationship with leaf water potential. That has very important implications in practical applications as well. Like for example, if we uh, fly with a lapse of just two or three days difference between the same um, for the same field over the same field with um, where we um, withhold uh, irrigation, we can very easily see differences in water stress depending on the areas of the field, and that has implications on irrigation efficiency and on water stress detection on uh, at the sub sub field uh, scale. Um, in specific crops, that's also linked so with the uh, um, quality, potential quality of fruits, yeah. for example, in oh, the case is, of vineyards, yeah. with selective harvesting being one of the most important applications that could come. Mapping water that. stress. Um, yeah. Or in cases of um, flying over fields where we have different type of um, species and where we are, that's the case, for example, of horticulture, um, where we can very easily, less than 24 hours, fly and then see the stress detection at the specific block level. If we look inside, we actually see the weeding block variability. So the grower might think that is managing the property very well, but we can see how, for example, this block that is showing no stress is actually very much heterogeneous inside, and that is due to soil properties, differences in soil properties, or differences in the irrigation engineering system that is in place. Um, for the synthetic pigments, we, we had to develop methodologies for the assessment of the photosynthetic pigment um, with, through modeling. In, in the 90s, we developed uh, one of the very first broad distortion models, the perfect model, that allows us to estimate chlorophyll and separate from foranoids uh, from uh, measured um, from the leaves. And later on, we've been able to add more and um, make more progress on these models to quantify and sustain these chlorophyll foranoids. And finally, even very recently, the santophyll dynamics. And the importance of, of that is that it's linked to the photosynthetic efficiency that could be quantified using reflections data. The, the reason why we can do that is because uh, we actually 
measure and understand the specific absorption coefficients of every pigment that we have in our leaves. Uh, at least the most important ones that we can try to quantify using the spectral resolution and the characteristics of the sensors that we have. And chlorophyll fluorescence. Chlorophyll fluorescence uh, is a very important indicator. It's been um, proposed many, many years ago, but in the last 20 years is when we have actually demonstrated that we can actually quantify the fluorescence emission. We are talking about a very small part of the radiation. We're talking about around 2% of the total incoming radiation that is um, reaching the leaves. Only around that is 2% is re-emitted at longer wavelengths because it's not used for the photosynthetic uh, processes. And the importance of that is that uh, chlorophyll fluorescence has been identified as one of the most important direct links with uh, photosynthesis and even um, will have a satellite mission to quantify fluorescence at the global scales. The fact in our case for stress detection is that we can use chlorophyll fluorescence as an indicator of stress because of the reduction of fluorescence as um, stress increases. And we have been developing methodologies for using oxygen features and Fraunhofer lines that are um, known where any radiation that we find inside are due to the chlorophyll fluorescence that is emitted from plants. These are either oxygen absorption features that we have in the atmosphere because the oxygen absorbs all the light that comes from the sun when the photons go through the atmosphere. Any light that we see inside is due to the emission of the vegetation and a way to quantify the fluorescence. That's the method that is called the Fraunhofer line depth principle. But also we have Fraunhofer lines in the atmosphere that are due to the solar um, flux that we have there. And the good thing is that we have demonstrated that we don't need $1 million instruments to do this quantification of fluorescence. We have actually used even nano hyperspectral miniaturized type of sensors like the one you see there in my hand um, that have allowed us from drones or from manned aircraft to assess and to demonstrate that the quantification of chlorophyll fluorescence is possible, first of all. Secondly, that it mimics very well the um, uh, temporal variability, the temporal evolution of assimilation because of the close link between chlorophyll fluorescence and photosynthesis, both in cases of um, non-stressed and deficit irrigation experiments, for example, where we want to access and to quantify um, indicators of water stress. While other more standard and typical indicators like NDVI, for example, are not sensitive to any photosynthesis related changes, we can demonstrate, we have demonstrated that chlorophyll fluorescence quantified from our sensors, which are flying over study sites, show relationships which are quite um, remarkable between the airborne quantified fluorescence and the field level assimilation uh, um, measured in, uh, at the same type of the flights. Not only with small sensors, if we want to quantify the fluorescence with using very narrow spectral bands, new sensors have been become available, like the one you see there, which is the one we are now operating here, which allows us to get extremely high resolution. All these are um, more than a thousand spectral bands um, of less than one nanometer full width of max, which means very, very narrow spectral bands that allow us to look inside the oxygen absorption features, but even looking at the Fraunhofer lines that we can detect um, from the radiance data that we obtain. Um, this was totally science fiction in some way some years ago. Now we are actually identifying Fraunhofer lines and getting full images of those Fraunhofer lines that allow us to look into chlorophyll fluorescence with a more, much more quantitative way. Um, in plant phenotyping and plant breeding type of studies, we can detect, identify single blocks, extract the full spectrum, and then using models, we can quantify the fluorescence at two different spectral bands using the oxygen A, uh, A 
uh, oxygen B and oxygen A, and then quantify the full fluorescence emission at the spectral domain between 650 and 800 nanometers that allow us to um, go, go closer into photosynthetic and photosynthesis assessments. Not only chlorophyll fluorescence, I, I've been working chlorophyll fluorescence for about 20 years now and I feel that uh, it's been oversold in some cases. Everyone is talking about fluorescence, anyone is doing fluorescence, that's good, but um, it's not the only one. It's not the only indicator, the only important thing. Like for example, Santofil cycle pigments allow us to look at the dynamics um, linked to the photosynthetic efficiency, and that's something that we can do much easier sometimes than chlorophyll fluorescence. And secondly, we have already demonstrated many years ago about how photosynthetic pigments in the Santofil cycle region, which is 530 to 570 nanometers are important for early detection of stress in the context of water and nutrient assessments. Um, in general, when we try to understand and to develop methods, robot sensing based physiology, um, I think it's quite important to understand the whole budget and the full vegetation interactions and the energy budget. We are trying to get as much as we can from reflectance all the indicators I talked about before, chlorophyll fluorescence and canopy temperature, and then try to understand the physiological changes that we can detect by analyzing those plant traits. In the last 20 years, we've been moving from indices to parameters and to actual function. And I think this has been critical. And if you look at the literature and try to quantify any particular parameter from vegetation, let's talk about chlorophyll and the link with nitrogen, or let's talk about any other photosynthetic pigments, coronoids, and anthocyanins, um, water content. The literature is full of what we call vegetation indices or optical indices. And you, you do a search and you can find, you can find hundreds of them. Um, I'm not saying we shouldn't do that any longer. I think that to investigate new indicators, I think it's important to start from there. But those relationships that I see, that you see there, which are very valid at the leaf level, and they are good indicators of a spe specific plant traits, which allow us to get this type of maps where we see the variability uh, of a specific indices, we are just seeing there an index and the variability of that index from one side to another or within each side the spatial variability. The fact is that uh, we need to move on and we should stop looking at those indices which are, don't have any physical meaning because what is the meaning of NDVI equals to 0.6? It's just an indicator, it's just a normalized index, it doesn't give us any physical meaning to parameters which are more physical. Um, so the scientific community has been moving slowly from hyperspectral indices to leaf and canopy parameters, like uh, we're in terms of talking of retrieving leaf area index, um, percentage cover, um, plant uh, height, um, and the pigments in particular, chlorophyll content, how much? Well, 55, 55 microns per square centimeter, for example, in those terms. Um, the only way that that has been possible is by the method I said before, is by linking leaf models to canopy models, which allow us to get um, that type of images where now we are not showing indices, now we are showing an actual parameter. We are showing the variability of one particular plant trait, chlorophyll or coronoids or anthocyanins or xanthophytes, because that is a more direct indicator and we are not just dealing with something that is not um, without a physical meaning as we were with indices. But we go even further. It's not only indices, it's not only parameters. We want to go to process-based indicators. We need to go to actual functioning. The whole idea is that I 
yeah, I mean, it could be of interest to know that my blog or my blog it's a, has 50 micrograms per, per square centimeter of chlorophyll, let's say. But so what? No? I mean, can we tell something else? Can we map, for example, stomatal conductance or photosynthesis or photosynthetic capacity? How can we do that? So I think that uh, we need to understand all these indicators as a whole, as a, um, they tell us different things in physiology. And we have reviewed the last, uh, that's a paper that we published uh, recently with the last uh, 50 years of progress in chlorophyll fluorescence, identifying some of these models that now are using all those parameters in a way to go into actual photosynthesis and stomatal conductance as, as the final goal of the retrieving um, parameters. The problem is that some of those models have many inputs, like the one you see there, um, we published uh, some work where we actually quantify BC max from hyperspectral remote sensing using chlorophyll fluorescence as a main proxy, as a main indicator. But the fact is that what, from whatever type of um, approach, we can now map um, BC max or assimilation in plots like the ones you see there, um, model based not empirically based, which means that in principle that could be applicable to same crop different areas or under different conditions. And finally, operational methods uh, were needed. We have to make progress on how can we handle the issue that we need to collect data whenever we need it and process it as soon as possible. And just to show you some of the platforms that I was dealing with when I was in in Canada um, um, or later on working for some of the NASA projects with the Avery's campaigns as part of the contribution from UC Davis and, and the Sea Stars lab where I was working later on in Europe uh, from the um, German Space Agency or the um, Italian, British or Spanish uh, Ministry of Defense where I was engaged with some of the um, instruments and this is not new, that slide actually, I got it from a presentation I made in around the year 2005. And could we replace the big platforms, expensive, relying on international or national organizations into something that we can fly ourselves? At that time, that was a question mark. Now we know the answer, the answer is yes. But that it's been possible only, not because of the platforms, but because of the technology that has been reduced and miniaturized and being cost effective. That's the imaging spectrometer I used to operate in the year 2000. That's more than uh, between half a million to $700,000 at that time. That's just about 10 years later. And that was just a few years later. So, I mean, the reason why we've been able to fly our own sensors and process quickly, not relying on others to do it, is because uh, of the miniaturization of all these platforms and miniaturization of all the technology that uh, we've had um, happening um, in, the, in the past uh, few years. That's the very first micro hyperspectral imager on board a six kilo platform that's coming from my lab when I was in Spain, and um, the, the first uh, scientific paper in a top journal in remote sensing came from that platform, and that was actually a real dream at that time, that uh, we could actually fly a six kilo platform with an imaging spectroscopy system inside. Um, nowadays, we consider that this is okay and this is valid, and I'd like to talk now in the final remarks about some of the limitations that I see anyway. So this is finishing now with the last uh, slide. So I think that uh, in the past 20, 25 years, uh, the progress has been really significant in a sense of both models and, and methods. Um, I think that uh, 
before I go into that, um, I think that uh, models and methods, I think that uh, models were absolutely needed in order to quantify parameters in a proper way. And the progress on methodology is what really was critical uh, for the understanding of the physiology and the physiological changes in rem using remote sensing data. I think that that's been possible because we try to go from indices to parameters and to functioning, and we are no longer interested on parameters which are have no physical meaning, and we are trying to understand and to quantify from remote sensing parameters which were impossible or um, only empirically retrievable in the past. I think that uh, the progress in solar induced fluorescence uh, has been remarkable and I, I think that it's been absolutely important all the progress that we've done but we have to be careful about it as well um, I think that is a bit oversold um, in some cases we are now looking at chlorophyll fluorescence as an only indicator of, of photosynthesis but we are forgetting about many other biochemical constituents or structural indices that, uh, or indicators which are also equally important or could be um, absolutely needed. Okay. I think that in the last 20 years we've been into technology push. And, um, examples of the miniaturization of the sensors are a good example. As I heard talking to one of the gurus in so Bray rings or G4G, or G, whatever it's G now in, in cell phones or this. So we've so gone so into so technology so push, so but now we need a methodology. I totally agree in that case in remote sensing. Um, we all or almost everyone has the technology now available for us. Anyone here could buy a hyperspectral imager or any sensor from any vendor and start flying very soon. What do we do with the data? How do we analyze the data? Which models do we need? Um, how can we use the models to retrieve parameters correctly? I think that's even becoming more important nowadays because of the huge amount of data that we can collect that sometimes I get contacted by people Pablo, I've been flying, I have so many data sets, I don't know how to, what to do, how to handle it, how to process the data, which models to use. My feeling is that the next 10 years, technology obviously is going to be very important, but the push in methods is absolutely needed. I think that uh, a very critical aspect that we shouldn't forget, and this is linked to the last point I'm going to make, is that we need to establish the links between physiology and remote sensing physics. And I, I repeat the, the word physics here. Um, all we're doing is radiation vegetation interactions. And we are trying to understand the way light interacts and the way light, light reflects, absorbs and scatters by vegetation. Unless we understand that properly, we cannot do anything in quantitative remote sensing. And that's the problem when we don't do that, all we have at the end is pretty pictures. And remote sensing, the people who do science with remote sensing, we don't like, I don't like to see pretty pictures as the final objective of some cases, in some cases. And that's linked with the drones and the drone aspect. Uh, I have the feeling that uh, we made a very big progress using drones as a way to collect data for our own experiments and as a way to not to rely on others and to be totally independent when we need to collect data, but have the feeling at the same time that drones are self, that we are self-limited by the fact that we are using drones. Why I'm saying that? Well, I've been discussing in, with many people saying, well, no, I cannot fly, I, I cannot install such sensor on the drone, so I, I cannot do that. Well. Why? Because the drone cannot fly the sensor you need to fly, that means that you are not going to do it. So 90% or 80% now, I think probably a bit more is increasing, is improving, but 90% of the people using drones are using miniaturized uh, 
small cameras, getting RGB, and that's it. And many of the things that we have been developing in the last 20 years in remote sensing and urban remote sensing, it's like we forget about it. It's like, no, I cannot do it, so don't we don't do it. Um, I cannot install a hyperspectral imager in my drone, so I'm not doing hyperspectral imager. I cannot install a thermal camera, so I'm not using thermal. Well, I've seen, I'm seeing, detecting that the drones, when they are the final objective, are not really bringing new ideas and new science, and they are actually limiting the fact that uh, uh, they are not using the most of the technology that is available. Yes, the drone flies very well, everyone likes to see the drone flying, and I have drones myself, but we need to look into the, fi the, the most advanced technology if we want to make progress on, on drone remote sensing as well. So that will be all. Thank you very much for your attention. That's my email address. If anyone is interested in discussing with me in the future, happy to interact with you. And I'll be I'm here in Melbourne, so easy to reach uh, if you need to discuss about anything. Thank you.